All right. Uh, well, let's get started this morning. Uh, obviously, we have a few families traveling this weekend still uh, for camping. You know, still, I'm sure they're going to get nice and wet and have fun with it still. And we have a, a few couples, of course, traditionally late, which is what's going to happen with Jules and Jeremiah. Is I'm going to call them out as they will come in, and we'll make sure that we make note of that, how late they are. Today, it's not Josiah. So Josiah made it on time. So good job, Josiah. Still clueless. Yeah, you know, Josiah made it on time today, so we're rewarding you for that with a clap. Good job, buddy. <laughs> oh, so what you're saying is your wife's fault, Nicole, huh? Okay. Nicole, you are hearing this from uh, my mouth to yours, that your ears, that uh, Josiah blames you for being late. Happy marriaging. All right, so just a couple of things. A barn update uh, is a good reminder. Um, this is our first service in here because we have poor leases today, which is by a benefit of a wedding done here yesterday. It's our first church wedding, which was awesome. And then, uh, but we are so close to being here permanently. So close. Water got dug last week. The water will be connected to the building this week. And then they're going to be digging some holes out here to put a septic system in. So we're only a few weeks away from being in here permanently, which is going to be a very exciting time. And then that just will change a lot of things for us. And I'm pretty excited about that. Grateful for our time in the garage, but ready to be in the barn for sure. Uh, also, just a reference to our blog that we do every week. Uh, I write a little something, something for you to read and maybe encourage you. And uh, two things came out of that blog this week that if you haven't read it yet, is one, God wants us to be right actions towards others. And the other one is God wants us to be, have a repentant heart. So I have right actions towards others, which goes right in line with our First John teaching, but then also have a repentant heart, which you'll find uh, will go right along with today's teaching out of 1 John as well. So after our, our teaching time, we will go into our sermon follow-up, which is usually about 20, 25 minutes uh, after we do the sermon. And we do these three, th three questions. Thoughts. What are your thoughts in this particular passage uh, or during the sermon? Questions. What questions come to mind when we talk about this specific passage? Or connections. What connections do you see this passage having with other pieces of scripture and or our lives? So those are three guiding questions that we do during our sermon follow-up time. So today will be our uh, sermon will be out of 1 John 5, 14 through 17. Let's pray to open our service and we'll lead in the worship. Father, thank you for who you are and the way you encourage us, guide us, and direct us. And Father, grateful for our, our first service in the barn. Uh, not our official start, but our, our grateful um, and a good reminder of what is to come. Father, thank you for encouraging us, guiding us, and directing us. And Father, may we just uh, honor you with our fellowship today. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to start with number 26, Waymaker, number 26. And then we're going to flip the page over to King of My Heart. So go ahead and stand with us. Waymaker, number 26.
that song. We're going to flip over to number 22, Glorious Day. Um, I think I read this verse last time we sang this, John 10, 10. Uh, we've talked a lot in 1 John about life and the life that Christ gives us and how often that life is lived out through love in one another. Um, John 10, 10 just reminds us that the thief comes to steal and he comes to kill and destroy. <laughs> but God comes and we have life. And not just life, but abundant life. So, sorry, I blame it on yesterday's wedding. <laughs>
All right. Well, uh, today, again, thankful to be in here today to be able to uh, have our first service, but not our official first service uh, in the Barn Church, uh, which has been fantastic. Uh, a lot of work getting here, as you all uh, are aware, or if you aren't aware, you're now reaping the benefits of it, uh, being able to be in here. So it's very exciting to uh, uh, be able to do this message here today. Today, if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 John 5, 14 through 17, that'll be our main text today. But now today, I must uh, pre-warn you that we will be flipping through our Bibles because we have some very important passages that go right along with our sermon that truly adds, um, well, I would say adds value. Uh, I'm not a huge, uh, all the time, doing flipping around, but today we must hear Jesus' words along with John to understand the importance of this message. See, now we're rapidly approaching the final sermon, which is literally next week out of this series we've been going through all summer. It's a time that um, has been exciting, but again, as we learned that the, the book of love sometimes comes out love <laughs> instead of love, 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 love. Because it is a command that we're hearing here. It is a you must do. You must love one another. Not a request and not just a uh, flippant passing, but an opportunity for us to truly understand that we must love one another, care for one another, and be with one another in that brotherly love. So today... We're going to be uh, looking more specifically at prayer, which, of course, we all understand the importance of it, the value of it. But not just prayer, but even confessing our sins, asking for repentance, seeking repentance, and getting that forgiveness for those sins. We have an advocate in prayer. We have an advocate that goes before us, which is Jesus. We have that truth of what he brings to the table. And we have a reason to receive prayer for one another. See, those aspects of prayer are so important. So now, since John's already talked about the subject matter, he wants to kind of bring it to a closure for this epistle. And in his final words, he's going to expand upon something. He's going to expand upon the theme of prayer that has already been introduced throughout this whole epistle. But this time it's going to be very emphatic about praying with confidence. Confidence. See, we, we, we sometimes pray and we're like, oh yeah, I should do this. It's part of the check mark. I must pray. But it's praying with confidence. Confidence is going to happen. See, most of the time we spend too much time waiting for the actual prayers to be answered. Then on our knees praying as if God's going to answer them. Here's the reality. In confidence, we know that he is going to answer them. But today you're going to hear one very key aspect. And that key aspect is are we in his will in our prayer? See, being in his will is always uh, what we think we are. We hope we are. For all the things we ask for, all the things we want and desire, we hope we're in his will with it, right? So we wait patiently and wait and wait and wait for it to be answered. But as you're going to find out throughout the sermon, you're going to find out that the reality is most of your prayer requests, you may never see, even in your lifetime. I tell you, you know, it's been five years since we started praying for Jules and Jeremiah. Look what happened yesterday. We got to see it. I'm thankful that he let us witness that happen. But those prayers are not sometimes answered today or even tomorrow. And today we have to look at that. That we pray with confidence. We pray that he's, it's going to happen. Because we're in his will and we're in his favor. And we also, hmm, we're going to talk a little bit more about that confidence of why when we ask something, we know it can happen. It's exciting. It's exciting to think about being in harmony with God. So that when you pray that you have no question whether it's going to happen or not. Because you already know you're in his will. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today too. Because uh, being in his will and how you know you're in his will is are you in his word? Are you in his word enough? 
Are you in his word with truth? Is that truth pouring into your heart and your mind? Because I tell you, there is no truth outside of this scripture. And so when we know scripture, we have it on our heart, we have it on our minds, we have it in our lives. Guess what? There's no lies that can break through that. Zero. So we know scripture, we have it on our heart, we abide in Jesus and we, Jesus abides in us. Then we know we're in God's will. We pray for something. Now I must say there is a little bit of weirdness with the scripture today. Some wording that comes out that makes you think, what was John really trying to say? And I'm going to give you my best effort. My best effort to try to answer that question. So today let's start with reading the scripture together, which is 1 John 5, 14 through 17. My Bible titles it Effective Prayer, which I love and uh, strongly agree with. Now this is the confidence we have before him. Whenever we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we, ha we have asked him for. If anyone sees his brother committing sin that does not bring death, he should ask, and God will give life to him. To those who commit sin that doesn't bring death, there is sin that brings death. I am not saying he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin that does not bring death. Death, life, sins, not so deathly sins, right? It almost sounds like John is painting a gray matter area. Is all sin bad? The answer is yes. <laughs> but there's a difference between someone who committed sin and is repentant. So although they did sin, they are repentant of that sin. And today we're going to talk a little bit about that and, and hopefully dial that back in. Because I don't want anybody to misunderstand those few verses that it means, well, I only stole $5. It's not a sin. Or it's not going to something to put me to death. All sin separates us from the love of Jesus. All sin. And so let's not misunderstand or think that there's some gray area there. So the first part of this in verse 14 and 15, we want to really think about have confidence in prayer. Have confidence in prayer. So we must pray with confidence, right? Now, it's very clear, though, in 14 and 15 that he says, have confidence before him whenever you ask anything according to his will. You see that? That's, that's the key answer, right? It's not just pray, I want a new car. Well, maybe you need a new car, right? Maybe something broke down and you really need a new car. That's difference. Now, my good buddy here, you he might be praying, man, whew, I really want a Lamborghini. Not that we can fit in it, but we're going to try. I really want it. I just want it shiny red. God, please give me a Lamborghini. Is that in God's will? I don't know. It might be. It might not be either. So the reality is, is making sure that we have a prayer that is within his will. Having confidence, right? But you must first have confidence that you know him. Have confidence that you have his will in your mind, his will in your heart, his will in your life. That is the key to it, to all prayer. So let's think about this, even from Jesus' own example. And so here's my first turn. I'm going to have you turn in the Bibles to Matthew 26, verses 39 and 42. Matthew 26 and 39. It's the first book in the New Testament. So if you start hearing weird names, you went too far. Matthew 26, Matthew 26, 39. It's okay that it takes us a few seconds to get there. It's meant because then we know where it is in our Bibles at that point. 39 says this, going a little further, he will face down he fell face down and prayed, My father, it is impossible. Let this cup pass from me. 
yet not as I will, but you will. Even Jesus, the Son of God, who we know to be our Lord and Savior, prayed for the Father's will, not his own. He knew what he was facing. He knew what he was going up against. He knew what was about to happen on the cross. Fast forward to 42 and it says this. Again, a second time he fell away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So here's the simple answer, right? The good old Sunday school answer because we're all Sunday school people. It's Jesus, in case you didn't know. Jesus is the answer. If Jesus says in the Father's will, then must we be in the Father's will? And the answer is yes. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We seek him and we follow his example for our lives. Now, Paul even learned the same lesson, right? If you turn over to 2 Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians 12, which if you go to Romans, about midway through the New Testament, then you got 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians First, 2 Corinthians 12. Verses 7 and 9. So even Paul had something to say about this. Especially because of the extraordinary revelations, therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, torment me, so I will not exalt myself. Concerning this, I plead with the Lord three times to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. God's will, not his own. I don't know if you have any kind of thorn in your flesh that you've gone through in life. It may be emotionally, it may be physically, it may be whatever. It might be something you're going through right now. But I promise you, you'll get carried through it. I tell you, you can pray all the time to take it away. But maybe quite literally, it is something you must go through in this moment in time. There are things in my life that I've gone through. You all are my family and friends, so you are well aware of things that we've gone through even recently. We didn't want to go through that. But on this side, I can promise you that I say, I am thankful that I went through it. But trust me, the whole time I was on my knees praying, let me go, release me. Or in Pastor Teddy's words, this sucks. Because people suck. <laughs> but Jesus said, no. We must go through something because he has a bigger plan for our lives. More on that subject matter in a few weeks. But it's great to see that even Jesus and then his apostle Paul had something great for us to learn. Now, they, Jesus had the privilege of having his father, right? Direct. Paul had the great privilege of Jesus speaking directly to him. Now, I have never heard Jesus' words. I've never had him stand before me. I've asked for it a few times because I want some explaining to happen. But I haven't had that privilege. There's no cloud that's come around. There's no burning bush. There's none of that that's come into my life at this time in my life. So I have to rely on his word. I have to rely on his word. That it, it is in me that I abide in the word, that I hear the word, I trust the word, I listen to the word, and that I have it on my heart. If you're not in your Bibles, get in your Bibles because the message will come out loud and clear when you're going through difficult times. When you're going through those difficult times, at those moments, Scripture will come to mind. Scripture will come and, and well, attempt to ease your heart. But guess what? Sometimes those Scripture isn't very easing. <laughs> Sometimes the scripture is, my grace is sufficient. And guess what? Sometimes that scripture sucks to hear. But that doesn't make it any other true. But we must have that word on our hearts. So we must be in the will. And the way we know we're in the will is if we're in the word. 
And if we're in the word, the greater confidence you are going to have and I'm going to have about are we in the will of God. Now, a few months ago, we didn't, uh, we could envision what it looked like to be in the barn, but we couldn't really like see it. We knew God was speaking to us because there's so many different moments three years ago that happened that spoke to us, had no idea this was going to happen. And then months ago, we had no idea the next step was going to be revealed. But greater confidence we can have in him because prayers were answered. To not only be here today, but be here with family and friends because of a wonderful, wonderful wedding yesterday. All things we could not have foreseen, but that God revealed because his scripture is truth. We must not only seek his will. We must not only stay in the word. But you must, you must obey his commandments. It's not easy sometimes. See, if you obey his commandments, you know you're in his will. How do you know you're in his will? Because you're in the word. You're trusting the word. You're trusting him. You're obeying the commandments. Now, the, the ten top or just the commandments? I don't know. Let's just love one another. Let's start with that one, the most important one, right? Let's love one another. Let's just start with that one. If we can just do that great, then what happens? We're in his will. We follow in his will. So in 1 John, we're going to flip through a couple things in 1 John because I think it's important too. 1 John 3, 22. 1 John 3, 22 says this and can receive whatever you ask from him because we keep his commands. We've already learned this lesson in 1 John. Keep his commands, and guess what? You can ask whatever you want. Can I ask about Lamborghini? You surely can ask, Eric. But doesn't mean that it's in his will. Doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Doesn't mean that you're going to get it. Doesn't mean you can't ask. God wants that relationship from us. God wants uh, us to ask Take this from me. He wants us to bow down on our knees and, and fall down and say, God, take this from me. It's too much. Doesn't mean he's going to do it. It means you might have to go through something. And guess what? He might actually give you that Lamborghini because he has a bigger purpose. I don't know what that would be, but it'd be fun getting there. So we have to think through that whatever we ask, as long as we stay in his commands, as long as we listen and obey. What about if you go to 1 Peter? So 1 Peter is right before 1 John. So we have 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John. So just a couple pages back. 1 Peter 3.12. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteousness, righteous, and his ears are open to their requests. So he's quoting a proverb there, obviously. But think about that. His righteous. What does it mean to be righteous before the Lord? Well, clearly Jesus said, obey the commands. He's very specific. Not obey the ones you want. And I'm telling you, Jesus made it so simple. The most important command is the love, right? Man, it's so simple. Yes, there's so much more to living as a Christian than just loving, right? But I tell you, if you put one foot in front of the other and you just love well, the rest will all fall into place. Not easy, but I'm saying the rest will fall into place. And John, if you <laughs> go back to uh, 322b again, 322b in 1 John, you look at the second part there. With angels, authorities, and power subjected to him, he is at the right hand. There's so much about that we can have confidence in knowing that Jesus is Lord. Confidence knowing that they're going to hear our prayers. Confidence knowing that they're going to answer him too. Again, you just might not see it for yourself. Let's go back to reading uh, verse 15, 1 John 5, 15 again. 1 John 5, 15. Oh, I totally read the wrong verse. I apologize. I was thinking out loud and, and I, I got ahead of myself. 
I was trying to think, that didn't write quite what, fit what I wanted to fit, but it, it, it's in the rant ballpark, I guess. Uh, 515. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked him for. Again, it's just a knowledge. It's just a confidence. It's just a purpose-filled moment, a statement saying that we can have confidence in him because we're in his will. And that confidence is not only in prayer, but in that he will answer them for us. Now, if we're in his will, we pray in his will, he will answer. It just might not be in your timing but in his. So if you're in his will and you trust you're in his will, just wait. Trust in confidence that he will provide what you've asked. And if you think about this from John, it makes so sense that he's saying, be in the commands, be in his will. From a apostle who strongly believes that we have to have brotherly love, Love for your brother, love for your sister, love for your church family, love for those that are even non-believers. As we've learned throughout this entire epistle, that he is calling us to love everyone. We should not be surprised to find him teaching about, I don't know, pray for your brother with compassion, as you find in verses 16 and 17. Pray for your brothers with compassion, Pray for our brothers. If you look at 16 and 17, again, we see, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin that does not bring death, he should ask, and God will give life to him. To those who commit sin that does not bring death, there is sin that brings death. I am not saying he should pray about that, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin that does not bring death. You see, you look at those pieces of scripture, and that's a good reminder for us. That we must have compassion and love for our brother. Not easily understood, of course, because what brings death and what doesn't bring death, well, again, it's not ours to figure out. But we do see our brother in sin, what are we to do? Well, you could flip over to Matthew 18 if you wanted to and see a very clear picture of how to approach your brother about sin, especially if they're not repentant. But also, I would say those that are repentant, it's important to approach them as well. But being in confidence, having love for one another, being compassionate for those who fall to sin, because not everybody is as perfect as you. Not everybody is as perfect as you are who do not sin at all, right? I appreciate the chuckles on that one. But he will give them life. But he will not give them life until repentance, right? Because forgiveness comes after repentance. If you have a person in sin and they're not repentant, they're like, oh, it's no big deal. It's my life. I'll do whatever I want. That is not a repentant heart. <laughs> we must be repentant. If we sin, repent. And if your brother is in sin, be compassionate, be loving. Don't, you sinner, you're going to downstairs. How about love them through it? Teach them truth. Have them understand scripture. Help them through any misunderstandings they have about scripture. Because that is what it means to be compassionate to your brother. Sin is sin, everybody. There's no good white sin. There's no, that's really bad. It's all bad. <laughs> all right? We teach our children, lying is a sin. And guess what? It is. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. We see this in John, and John lays it out for us. And again, it, it sounds complicated in verse 16 and 17 for us to truly grasp what he's saying because it says some will bring you death and some will bring you life some will be you won't bring you death but it's bad 
But what they're talking about, he's just referencing the Old Testament way of sacrificing, old way of paying a, a penance for when you sin. There was scales in a sense. You bring two doves for this, 12 doves for this. You have to bring a calf for this. So in the New Testament time, you got to think through this is in 60 AD. I mean, it's not too far removed from being the Old Testament being fulfilled that we see this. So there's some old language like that that comes out. But what he's saying here is it doesn't matter. All sin must have repentance, period. And without repentance, there's death. And that is something we don't want to see. We must pray for our brothers. We must pray for our sisters. That if they're in sin, that I dare say we say, God have mercy on them, right? Which is something we say in our lips. But that's not what we mean. What I mean is drive my brother to his knees so that he asks for repentance so that you can forgive him. Because I can't forgive him. I mean, I can forgive you hurt me, but that's, that's earthly forgiveness. I am not the father. I cannot give you eternal forgiveness. And so my prayer is not have mercy on their soul. My prayer is drive them to their knees so they seek repentance and ask for forgiveness from the father. Because that's the only way to it. That's the only way that it makes sense. That is the most compassionate thing we can do. Brother, get on your knees and ask for forgiveness. That is compassion. Now there's a way to do it. I might be on my soapbox right now and, you know, telling you. But if I had to come to you, it would feel a lot different. If I had to come to you, you would witness me putting my arm around you and going, come on. You know better. Seriously. And here's why you know better. You know the word of God. You know the truth. But act like you know it. And that is a part of truth that is hard. But I tell you, it is the most compassionate we can be to our brother, to our sister, to our family. It's for them to seek forgiveness. One more quick turn back to 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother is in the darkness until now. That until now is till you present the light. Because guess what? Some people, when they're in darkness, they cannot see light. You know why they can't see light? Because they do this. I don't want to see the truth. Present the light. And guess what? God will get the repentance. But it's our being obedient and compassionate to our brothers and sisters that we present the light. If they're unwilling to see it, take their hands off their eyes, pry their blinders off, and help them see the light. That is being compassionate. That is being loving. That is being merciful. That is being a loving brother in the life we call living for Jesus. Let me wrap this sermon up before we go into our sermon follow-up time with a couple of thoughts. It is a privilege to pray. It is not a burden. It's a privilege to pray for one another. It's a privilege to pray for those you don't even know. Because God gives us that privilege because you should pray with confidence, but pray with compassion as well. And two things for you today as believers to even be able to fulfill the requirements to be a faithful prayer warrior is this. Abide in Jesus. Be in him. If you're living in sin, Guess what? You're not in him, <laughs> and he is not in you. It's oil and water, right? Put water in something, put oil in something, it separates. Same thing with Jesus and sin. You have sin in your life, you're crowding Jesus out. You have Jesus in your life, you're crowding the sin out. Can't occupy the same space. But Jesus can shine the light in the darkness. That is the truth. So abide in Jesus. Letting his words abide in you. 
and his words are the Bible, the truth that we can live our lives on. Are you keeping his commandments? That's what it means to be a prayer warrior. We're asking God for all intercessory time, right? I'm intercessing on your behalf because you've asked me to pray with you, or I know to be praying with you. That is the truth. But are you keeping his commandments? Because maybe your prayers will fall on deaf ears because you're not talking to the one who knows you. Remember that door? We get up there one day and we're going to knock and Jesus might even open it just a crack and say, I don't know you. It's kind of hard to talk to God through a door. So make sure you're in him and he in you. Ask according to his will. We know his will because we read scripture. Have compassion for your brother. All those things, what it means to be a brother in Christ. Pray for yourselves. I, do, I mean it, pray for yourselves. For in his will. And all things will be given upon you. Now, we all need the fullness of God's blessing, right? We all want it. We all desire it. But we must live our lives if they, if, as if he matters. But let's encourage one another. That's what our fellowship's all about. Our fellowship is all about encouraging one another, loving one another, caring for one another. And that is the encouragement we need to pray. That is the encouragement we need to be a prayer warrior that has confidence and is compassionate in the Lord. Let me close out on that thought. Have confidence when you seek the Lord and be compassionate with your brothers. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the way you encourage us, guide us, and direct us. And Father, we're just so thankful for our time together today. So thankful for our uh, time invested in you and what it means to fellowship with one another, love one another, care for one another. Father, may you guide and direct our hearts May our fellowship honor you. May the food nourish in our bodies and our minds. And may our fellowship bring honor to you. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll take a brief break and get some more drinks and snacky stuff if you'd like. And then we'll just turn back in for maybe 20 minutes of our sermon follow-up time. And we'll continue on from there.